back. The, uh, the Northampton School Committee is going to be is resuming now in open session. We already opened an open session at 6:45 and then uh, convened into executive session. We've now moved out of executive session back into open session, and we'll now move on to our agenda. Um, uh, we have a couple of quick organizational <coughs> issues before we move into the public comment period. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the election of vice chairperson. Uh, that's on my agenda under organization. And so um, I, I know we deferred on this issue in January because there was some question about whether or not the uh, charter would have affected it. Um, in looking at, um, in looking through it and discussing it in the Rules and Policy Committee, I think the intent of the charter is that this election would take place at the beginning of a session, at the beginning of a new kind of two-year term, as defined in the new two-year terms for all the school committees. But for this particular election, it's sort of within the discretion of the school committee if it wants to re-elect the vice chair in this, this particular year. Um, and so I think um, Ms. Pick felt that because she had been elected to a one-year term when she was elected, that she wouldn't want to just assume a two-year term, that she wanted the body to, um, for this sort of interim period, to hold another election. So that being said, I would open the floor to nominations for uh, vice chair. I'd like to nominate Ed Zuhowski. Vice Chair. Okay. Are there any other nominations? I'd like to nominate Stephanie again for um, Vice Chair to continue. Okay. So, um, any other nominations? Okay. So, we have two nominations on the floor. We have a nomination for Stephanie Pick and for Ed Zahowski. Um, uh, accept the nomination. Okay. Well, I was going to, um, uh, well, I, I believe you've accepted the nomination. We've never been in this position before. We usually are pretty clear when we get here to the table. And I actually didn't know you were doing this today. Um, but I, I will defer happily if this is something that Ed wants. And um, if you're doing it for years, if it's something that you want to take on, I will well, support that. I know that. that you have been doing it for years. And I know last year we, um, amended our bylaws to permit you to serve yet another year, um, extending what our bylaws say, and we do have the term limit in there. And we're not here to debate the term limit tonight, but w we certainly are here to discuss whether or not we would want to, and I realize that with the new charter, it, it may or may not be significant, but again, look at our old rules and make a change yet for another year, allowing a vice chair to serve two years beyond what our bylaws once said. So with that said, um, and with no one else coming forward other than the sitting vice chair, I would certainly uh, entertain uh, a vote with my name in the, the ring for the position. Okay, so, um, so I didn't actually ask for a vote to close the nominations, but I believe we've closed nominations. So um, I guess you've made a statement. Do you wish to make a statement of any kind? Or? If Ed is willing to do it, then I will um, not accept the nomination and defer. Okay. So, okay. Um, so you're withdrawing your... <laughs> Is there discussion on nominations and such? Certainly, if you certainly, there can be discussion or comments about any of this. I, I just want to say that my nomination of Ed is no reflection that it it contains no ill will whatsoever. I greatly appreciate all of the work that you have done as vice chair. We we really, um, I think you've done an excellent job, and it was no reflection on your performance. It's simply an opportunity to allow someone else to take over. Who? Okay who wants to do the work. And I would say the same thing, only to reiterate what I said a few moments ago. My nomination isn't uh, in, in any way, shape, or form uh, an accusation against your performance or your hard work and all that you've done in the last four years. In fact, I'm doing it really to offer you a break and to have a sigh of kind of relief in a one last year 
if you so choose not to run again next year where you don't have to have the responsibilities of a vice chair. I'd like to offer that to you if I could. I've spent the last two years saying this is my last year, so there was no part of me that thought I was going to do it this year, but when this all came up, I was willing to, but I am very happy to um, hand it over. So thank you for, for your comments. And I just want to say with the new charter, the rules and policy, um, with the term being different, that changed the terms also of, of how many years somebody could um, could run. That was one of the things that was brought <coughs> up. So, but I do understand because last year you were rather adamant about not wanting to have to do it. And so I, I think it's wonderful that you stepping up to the plate to be respectful of what Stephanie wanted. But I think also I'd like to put on record, I think you've done a wonderful job. Thank you. Any other discussions about, uh, well, the, the, I guess now the nomination that's on the floor? Um, okay. So um, then I would ask, uh, there's only one nomination, I guess, on the floor, so I would ask for a vote. Um, all those in favor of the nomination of Ed Zahowski as vice chair say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the uh, the election of the new we vice chairs. The ritual of changing of the chairs right now. And I'll right. just well, say that I'm very <laughs> sad to see you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've been happy over here with my, 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 my guys on each side. Thorns. Yeah, well, bye -bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. I haven't sat here. Oh, this in feels years. weird. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fine. Okay, and thank you. Well, I, this was all of this was a bit of a surprise to me all the way around. So. I wasn't quick enough to get my phone out and capture that. I sat here for a long time before I sat over there. Okay, so we've had a slight rearranging of the seating. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we'll now move on. The next item um, is the setting of the annual meeting schedule, which I believe we've done. Is there, are there any changes to that? Or? No, no. Okay. It's so, all, it's as is. so that still remains the same. Um, the next item are subcommittee assignments. Um, and I wanted to say uh, that um, under the charter, the chair has now been given the role of making committee assignments, but I did want to respect the process that you've had in the past of the vice, the elected vice chair really kind of helping to lead that process. So what I asked, I asked the vice chair to work with me and to, and to collect the information from you and to make recommendations to me about um, the, the um, subcommittees. And so these uh, assignments that I'd be announcing reflect that process that you've done every year. So um, on the Budget and Property Committee, um, uh, Mr. Zahowski, uh, Ms. Pick, and Mr. Bourne. On the Rules and Policy Committee, uh, Mrs. Minnick, uh, Ms. Duvall, and uh, Mr. Moore. On the Curriculum Committee, Mr. Flynn, uh, Mr. Shefflow, and Mr. Meyer. On the Negotiating Committee, uh, Ms. Pick and Mr. Meyer. Uh, the Rep to the Collaborative, uh, Mrs. Minnick. Our Parliamentarian, Mr. Meyer. Our legislative liaison is Mr. Bourne. Our representative to the Northampton uh, Pre or Prevention Coalition uh, is Ms. Duvall. Uh, the SPED PAC liaison is Mr. Flynn. Uh, the representative to the Tech Committee is Mr. Shefflow. Uh, and then our representative to both the Northampton Education Foundation and to the Northampton Community Television uh, Boards is Mr. Moore. Uh, and then, uh, this is more of an ad hoc, but we recently uh, f formed the new Start Time Committee, and uh, Mr. Moore and Ms. Duvall are serving on that. So those are the um, subcommittee assignments, and we'll put those in writing and have those updated uh, on the website. Um, the What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the conference committee, which I guess I, I uh, skipped over. Uh, yeah, that would be um, Ms. Mr. Meyer, uh, Ms. Duvall, and Mr. Flynn on the conference committee with the school, uh, with the city council. 
thank you for catching that. And, and again, thank you um, uh, to Ms. Pick for her help in putting that together. So that concludes the organizational portion of the meeting, and now we'll move into the public comment session. And there's uh, one speaker signed up, uh, Stephanie Grimaldi. And um, we just ask you to state your name and address for the record, and I'll keep a three-minute timer here. Okay. I'm Stephanie Grimaldi, 42 Platinum Circle in Florence. I'm a parent of an eighth grader, a fifth grader, and possibly a kindergarten student, and that's why I'm here. Um, I've heard discussions uh, around town that there is a proposal on the table to implement a tuition for kindergarten as part of um, reducing the extraordinary shortfall that I'm aware of. I also know that um, the schools have been cut dramatically year after year after year, and we've kind of gotten to the point where really hard decisions need to be made. And I think that that's a separate conversation because I think that's a bigger picture, and we really need to think about how the schools are funded generally. But I'm really here just about the tuition for kindergarten. Um, I'm also an educator. I've been in a public school educator for over 20 years. Um, and so I have a couple of personal comments about it and a couple of professional comments about it. One is um, it feels kind of unfair to me that there is an idea that closing the gap is going to sit on the shoulders of a very, very small segment of the students, of the population those parents are going to pay. And there are also a large number of those parents who are not probably aware of this even being on the table because they do not yet have kids in the system. The other thing is this morning as I was listening to NPR, I was listening to our president speak of the benefits of early child education. And um, by going to our state mandated half day kindergarten, you're really going to have to think about how that academic focus stays within those 2.5 hours and that um, the tuition part of the day really becomes enhancements or extracurriculars or specialists. I think that's going to cause a lot of scheduling changes for the um, scheduling challenges for the elementary schools. I also think that in the long term you're going to see um, a decrease in the achievement of our students in the later grades because we know that a very solid early childhood education yields great benefit as kids move through the system. So I ask you to proceed with that idea with great caution and great thought and great reflection on what it means for the parents of those children and for the reputation of the Northampton Public Schools going forward. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in the public comment session? OK. So um, we now move on to announcements. And I believe Mrs. Minnick has an announcement. I was just going to let you know that Stephanie is a former member of the school council. Is that, did she just walk out? Yep. Oh, <laughs> I think she's a former school member of the are you a current or former school council member? I am a JFK school council member currently, and I am a former Ryan Rose school Thank council you. member. Thank you. I get, like, I get schools, and I'm an involved parent, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go take care of that for you. <laughs> Thank you. So I just wanted to make that point that she was also on a school council. Thank you for that announcement. Is there another, any other announcements by members of the school committee? Oh, sorry. I have Spec two. Um, the first is that I um, uh, received a, an invitation from NEF for us to consider whether or not we were going to enter a team into the spelling bee that is on March 27th, and I would certainly hope that we would. That's something that we've been supporting for as long as I can remember. It's $250 for a team. Um, generally, we've all um, divided that up and shared that and put forth um, three members to go and spell for us. Um, I don't think we have to name the three members right now, but we, I think we should make a decision about whether or not we're going to do that so that we can um, let them know to put our name on the, on the list of spelling bee teams. So um, that's an announcement, but I think that that's a decision that we need to make before the end of the night. Okay. I don't know if you want to do that now or under new business. Or um, I suppose we don't. We may want to wait till new business if we want to have a discussion of it because it's not really 
during this program. And the second announcement that I want to make is in no way um, correlated to the decision that got made here about the vice chairship, but I would like to announce that this is my 12th and final year on the school committee. I'm saying early that I will not be running again um, next fall, and I'm saying that now so that people in Ward 5 can start thinking about whether or not this is something that they want to do, and if anybody has any questions about it, I'd be happy to um, speak with them and meet with, um, meet with anybody who is interested. Um, it's a huge commitment, but it's the most wonderful commitment you can make in Northampton as far as I'm concerned. I've, I've really loved this. I started when my daughter was in kindergarten. She's graduating from high school this year. Um, and uh, it's it's time for new, new blood to take Ward 5 over. So I'm, I'm giving plenty of notice for Ward 5 people to start thinking about who's next. Are there any other announcements? Cool. We don't know. <clears throat> Hearing none, uh, I would then move into uh, recommended actions. Um, and we have uh, tonight the consent agenda. Uh, the items that are on that consent agenda, we have the uh, approval of the minutes of, of your Thursday, December 13th, 2012 uh, school committee meeting. Uh, there are also uh, two contracts. Uh, the first is the uh, business manager's employment contract. And the second item is the Heinemann Book Company contract uh, for $5,761.80. There's also a field trip, some field trip requests. We've got the NHS academic team uh, field trip to Atlanta, Georgia. That's May 24th uh, through May 27th, 2013. Uh, and that is uh, uh, organized by uh, Ms. Rolick, uh, JFK Latin trip to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, May 24th, 2013. Uh, and Mr. DeLue is the, um, is the person uh, in charge of that trip. So that, those are all of the items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Okay. Second. Is there a second? Okay. Um, I would actually ask for a roll call vote on tonight's consent agenda, please. I'd like to ask for a roll call vote. Mr. Downey Meyer? Aye. Ms. Lisa Minnick? Yes. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. Ms. Stephanie Pick? Yes. Mr. Andrew Shelfo? Yes. Mr. Ed Zahowski? Yes. Mayor David Darkowitz? Uh, no. Mr. Alden Bourne? Ms. Bludeval? Yes. Motion carries. Excellent. So the consent agenda is adopted. Okay, we'll now move into the reports and recommendations, <coughs> and I don't see our student representative tonight, uh, so uh, we will, we will uh, it's Valentine's Day, uh, we will um, move on to a report uh, uh, by uh, JFK Principal Leslie Wilson on the progress of the JFK 8th grade math curriculum, and I would recognize uh, Ms. Wilson and, and her team. <laughs> smart math people there. Uh, sorry, did we want to have the teachers who were giving the field trips speak about their field trips at all? No. Okay. They were only here if there were questions. Okay. Well, thank you. Could you also just introduce the yep, folks we're who are with you? Yeah, Great. We'll Excellent. So, just, uh, this is the virtual math team and I think that really speaks to um, who they are. And I just need to say that it's been a privilege to work with the vertical math team and our ongoing work together to implement the new math pathway. Um, on the agenda, it says that it's eighth grade. Actually, we're in the beginning stages of implementing the new pathway, and the changes have been in seventh grade this year, and we'll then be rolled up eighth grade next year. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. But the conversations that have been happening about math and instruction and assessment really about students, um, exceptional. And it's just been a privilege to work with them. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, we might as well have everybody introduce themselves. This is Jeanine. Hi, my name is Jeanine. I'm the vice principal here at Northampton Middle School. Uh, I'm going Kathy Adams, grade 6 math, and I'm department chair at JFK. 
My name is Sharon McGill. I'm here at JFK Special Education 7th grade. Hi, Tim Levy. I'm a 7th grade math teacher here at JFK. And so I'm really going to turn it over to the vertical math team to give you some information about the implementation of the uh, new math pathway. I do want to say that uh, we've heard lots of positive feedback from parents, from teachers, from students. It's really um, been really uh, well done so far and um, everybody's working really hard at it. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim, I think, to begin with and Sharon. I'm going to say you guys are a lot calmer than the group I'm used to presenting to. <laughs> so um, once again, I'm a seventh grade math teacher here. So this is my sixth year at JFK. And the biggest change for me is this is the first year I've had heterogeneous classes. And while it was a challenge at first, I'm starting to become a lot more comfortable with it. And I think the kids are um, adopting it. It's what the kids are used to. So it, it doesn't. it's not a big change for them. A couple of things that have, I've noticed that have been working really well are we used to be broken up into three levels. The maybe lower 20% of the kids were in a class called applied math. Maybe the middle 60% were in what we called middle school math. And then maybe the top 20% in seventh grade were in a seventh and eighth grade math class. So now that they're all in the one group, a couple of things I've noticed that have been great is the kids who are kind of at the higher end in the applied classes. I think it's really nice for them to be mixed in with students of all abilities. They get to uh, participate in conversations, that rich conversations that wouldn't have happened in their applied classes. They get to see kind of other better examples of student work from their peers than they did in those applied classes. Also, I think it's good that we're not pushing the high-end kids through seventh and eighth grade math in one year. It's a lot of curriculum. And from what I've heard from the high school folks, when those kids would get to honors classes, some gaps kind of had developed when they pushed through seventh and eighth grade math in one year. And you know, the new frameworks, it's big about teaching to mastery. And I feel we can really teach to mastery more with these high-end kids and challenge them the way they need to be challenged. I think in the past, in the seven, eight math class, they had to push through so much curriculum. It was more about getting through curriculum and not really challenging the kids. So I, I think they're getting appropriately challenged here. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we differentiate. Uh, did you guys get the handouts? There's a, a game board. I'll talk about that first. So this is, if you'll notice, it's double-sided. Basically, it's, have you guys all heard of Connect Four before? Basically, they play Connect Four on this board by adding the numbers below the board. So they have two paper clips that can be placed on any of the numbers on the bottom of the board. And basically what they do is when the two clips are placed on the bottom on those numbers, they add those two clips and cross off the sum on the grid. And the goal is to get four in a row. So if you look at one side has integers, one side has fractions. So all the kids kind of start by playing the game with the integers on it. That's the easier of the two games. And some kids move on and play the game with the fractions on the back side. Those would be your higher end kids, while some other kids will just stick with the side that has integers on it. So that's one example of how we differentiate a lesson. There's another handout you'll see there. I think it's behind there. And so this came from an uh, activity we did with multiplying fractions. And so with this class assignment, all the kids did the top half of it. And the kids really move at different speeds, so the kids who are really fluent with this would then move on to the bottom half of it, which is kind of an extension where they learn to simplify expressions where you're multiplying fractions. So, you know, everyone kind of does the top half, and for those kids that are ready for the next challenge, it's built into that for them. Another nice thing about those activities, you'll see that there's a riddle at the top, and then at the bottom of the page, there's a little place where they write in letters. So. These uh, assignments here really lend themselves nicely to students self-checking their work, which is kind of helpful when kids are working on different things. Uh, just to talk a little bit about how we assess kids, uh, I generally give two or three different assessments, uh, varying levels of difficulty when I give tests, and kind of gauge you know, what kids have mastered and try and give the kids an assessment they can experience some success on that appropriately challenges them. And um, another thing that's been key is planning and co-teaching. So Sharon Deal is a special ed teacher on our team, and we've been spending a lot of time kind of before school talking about what we're going to be doing the next few weeks, what we're doing that day, what she can do to help her kids out, learning strategies. 
So we took a release day in October. It was the other seventh grade math teacher, myself, Sharon, and the other seventh grade special ed teacher. And we basically talked about what our next two units were going to be, kind of mapped those out for the special ed teachers, and gave them some suggestions on how they could help support their kids um, and how they could help their kids succeed, pre-teaching. And you know, I'm going to let Sharon talk a little bit more about that, if you want to sure. jump in. Um, so one of, the, one of the key things, I think, is time for us to implement the inclusion model. And time is like we don't have a lot of time um, to do that often. We have team time. Um, and that has a lot of different components to it within the Green Revolution. We have parent conferences, IEP meetings. So team time, Tim and I have really been working hard um, before school, during school, after school, whatever we can, and during some of the team times that we do have to kind of set up lessons that um, will support some of my students um, as well as the high-end students. Um, and we've also worked together during team time or before school um, on talking about um, what the skills my kids will need in order to find success. For instance, um, we were fortunate enough to have that release day, which was great because we could talk about the next two units we were going to look at. And this is my first year in seventh grade. I've done eighth grade and sixth grade. So doing the CMP model. Um, so it's a little bit different for me, but Tim was able to explain to me the next two units during this time. We were able to look at the common core. We were able to look at scope and sequence and then kind of map out what the basic skills my students would need to possess in those classrooms in order to find success. So then during my learning strategies class, I have a learning strategies class that I teach one day, um, I mean every day for 45 minutes. Um, usually a component of that class, I'll pre-teach or reteach concepts that he's going to um, go over. But I also, um, from meeting with Tim, um, we were doing a com uh, comparing and scaling unit on fraction decimal percent. So what I needed to do was really um, look at where the kids were at, my group was at, in terms of equivalent fraction decimal percent, reducing, solving proportions, and then try to um, provide them with pre-teaching or reteaching lessons to support so when they went in the classroom they weren't being thrown in with content they didn't quite understand. Um, and so that's been really essential for Tim and I to get together. We also were able to get together about another unit, um, and this was on percent of a number sales tax tips and, um, and sale price. And so I was able to create lessons after Tim and I got together so that my kids would understand what was going to be happening um, that day or the next week. Um, and working with Tim has been great. We, um, we also, in addition, had a, had a professional development. And Tim worked with his counterpart creating um, some benchmark assessments, which will be great for us to continue to create those benchmark assessments, because that will help inform instruction and create lessons that, um, where we see the gaps um, to help us kind of go back and reteach some concepts maybe from those benchmark assessments, um, once we get the data from those benchmark assessments. Um, also on a professional development day, um, Tim and I were able to sit down together and look at um, the MCAS graphic organizer. My kids all get a graphic organizer for the MCAS according to their IEP. So we were able to kind of look at what needs to be on that graphic organizer so that we can get it approved by DOE. So, you know, really the essential things for um, the special ed kids in those classes are for Tim and I to have more time to do differentiated instruction. Um, that would be great. And to also maybe think about having our kids, or my kids, all of our kids, have some more remedial math programs so that the basic skills that they're coming in with, um, there's another place they can get some of those filled besides my learning strategies class. Um, we work really hard in there, but I have to cover math, science, social studies, and language arts uh, in that 45-minute block. So, um, you know, um, I, I just want to thank, you know, thank you guys for giving us that release day because that did give us, you know, a lot of time to spend together to come up with some ideas about how we're going to um, pre-teach and reteach some concepts. Tim, do you have more? 
didn't have anything else. <laughs> yeah. No, not at this point. Can we talk about where we're going now? Okay. Sure. Yeah, I just want to add a couple things. Yeah. So um, just a, a couple other things to point out. Um, one of the things that we have been talking about are enhancements and safety nets, and I think that we're really embedding those things uh, within our curriculum and, and in my observations of the math classes, one of the things that strikes me is the flexibility within the heterogeneously grouped classroom where students on any given day with their strengths and maybe the areas where they're struggling a little bit um, can be grouped uh, very easily, much more easily than in a way where uh, we were when we were level. So I think that's a real advantage that we do have that flexibility. If I'm really strong in one skill but not in another, that's something that the teachers have found through their formative and summative assessments and we're using that model through learning centers and differentiating in the classroom. So I think that's been something that's really been striking me in my observations in the classroom. Uh, we are going to move on a little bit now to the professional development. Uh, do you want to speak a little bit? Or? I can. Anybody? Yeah, Eli participated in some of the professional development. I'll go through um, just the list with you, but if Eli wants to speak about a couple opportunities, uh, especially the MIMSI pre-AP and some of the facets work has been really, really terrific. Yeah. So I'm just going to briefly speak to some of the professional development that my colleagues and I have been working on to try to make this transition as smooth as possible for us and to, to make this work because it's a big transition for us maybe not as much for the kids but we're really trying to work as hard as we can to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students um, the mass math and science initiative was kind of spearheaded by the state when these new common core curriculum came down it started to push some of the stuff that they were asking kids to do to lower levels so we kind of had to restructure our curriculum and in order to do that we needed materials to kind of make that happen. So that training is kind of giving us this, the actual tangible materials to bring to the classroom that do these differentiated lessons for us. They're scaffolded in a way that they build in supports for the kids who kind of struggle with it. They give you a little concrete foundational knowledge of the you know, concept and then they build to those higher kind of extension and enrichment levels for the kids who are able to go to that next level. And the nice thing about the MIMSI stuff is it's on a continuum I have the learning progression for from sixth grade all the way up through high school level. So if kids want to go ahead and work at you know higher levels of stuff, if they're that motivated and they have the ability to do that, we now have the resources to get that done because we're being trained in activities that kind of adhere to those sort of things. The Common Core Practices Workshop that uh, Tim and I attended last summer is kind of the same deal. There's like um, seven core principles that come with this Common Core curriculum and this training was basically trying to give us um, activities and way to structure our classroom to kind of best you know meet the different needs of our students and this was designed for teachers in a heterogeneous classroom um, so that's what those activities are kind of designed to cater to uh, the facets training is something I was involved in for two years and there's teachers in the building who I think have been doing it longer than that um, it's basically training around formative assessment specifically geared towards mathematics which is something that's actually new in the United States we're kind of one of the first schools to be doing this we're kind of piloting this research for the rest of the nation this is a uh, national foundation that's running this but basically it's again it's ways to kind of structure our classroom organize our room so that we're meeting needs of our individual students it's also working with the inclusion teachers I think um, almost all of them are a part of this as well so it gives us ways to interact with our co-teachers and be able to build in those um, extra supports in the classroom with the co-teaching model that is you know that's a difficult thing to do so we're working really hard on different strategies and methods to try to really support the kids who need it as well as obviously catering to the kids who are working at and above grade level um, and certainly we spend our professional work days a uh, good deal of it is spent in department time, grade level departments all together as a math department. We bounce ideas off each other. We ask you know, each other what's working, what's not. The seventh grade teachers have really been you know, kind of telling us what's working well for them and what we can expect next year and how we can best um, design our classrooms to, to aid in this transition as best that we can. Um, and we'll also be taking some release days in the future, myself as well as some members of my team, to continue to work on the new eighth grade curriculum and how we're going to best supplement it with what we have and continue to work um, as hard as we can to get this done. I think that's and that's 
really the next phase is that it's this year's seventh graders are the first group who are really participating in this change. When they're eighth graders next year is where we're going to have that first sort of rolling down of the Algebra 1A content into eighth grade. So what we're looking at coming up is a release day and some summertime work where we can get together as a vertical team and do the work of actually taking those 1A pieces and fitting them into the eighth grade curriculum so that we have that curriculum set up with plenty of support and also plenty of enrichment for the kids who want it and need it. So that's pretty much the next big phase. All right. Oh, well, in the test, I guess that's the other piece, is that in addition, in the summertime, in addition to creating the curriculum, we're going to work on refining the eighth grade um, test, which we're looking at piloting. Um, so we're looking at taking a release day in March um, to take our sort of version of the eighth grade assessment right now and refine it and get it to a place where we feel really good about piloting it this year with our, our eighth graders for the first time. I think one of the um, key pieces to the professional development, too, is the vertical math team meetings that we've been having, but also there will be a joint uh, Northampton High School and JFK math um, department meeting coming up the end of February. And uh, we just had a sample of, I think, what the conversations are going to be at that meeting when we had a couple of our math teachers here join this group last week. And I couldn't stop them talking about what's happening at the high school and what's happening at the middle school and how really great this whole um, implementing this pathway and the new um, Common Core has been going and how interested they are in that. Uh, the development of the benchmark assessments, too, I think that's just a big piece in this. They, we are developing by departments here grade level common benchmark assessments. So all of the students in seventh and eighth grade, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade will be taking uh, three or four common assessments, and that will help us inform our instruction. And it also will give us a look vertically across the entire grade level, as I mean, horizontally across the entire grade level, as well as vertically to inform um, instruction in that direction. So that's a, a big piece of the work that we're doing now. Um, I think that probably is <coughs> an update that is helpful. Uh, if you have questions, we're here to answer questions. Uh, I really want to say that. Did you, <coughs> Mr. Moore? I had two questions. Um, the first one, I'm not sure who it's for, but you know, the formative assessments. What does that look like in terms of how much time does it take, and and um, you know, what's the what, what does it look like in a classroom? Is it just like a a quiz, a test, what's it? Good question, no, it's, it's actually an entire teaching cycle. It starts with the teacher, goes to the student, and comes back onto the teacher, which deals with questioning techniques, student feedback, teacher feedback, having direct, uh, clear learning goals and intentions. The students kind of become aware of what they need to do to become successful, and kind of designing activities to have them kind of be a little bit more aware of their learning process, and taking some mo little more responsibility for their learning. So, the f so when you say formative assessment, it sounds as though it's, when it, that's what I was saying. It, it sounds like it's saying like a test, but it's more of a process. Yeah, ex ex it's exactly. That <laughs> yeah, summative assessment would be more of a test. Formative assessment is like an ongoing process where you're kind con constantly checking in with students where they're at in the learning process okay. to kind of redirect as you go, rather than just check at the end. Right. And then I guess my second question actually is sort of the, the, the then it would be the formative assessment of this whole program, which you're working on now. Um, the big the big question when we started with it last year, I mean you know, this this last fall, was whether or not um, we would end up with as many ninth graders, at least as many ninth graders at the same at the upper end as we were with having the split into the advanced math class. And um, so, what's our formative assessment to say? Is this, are we on track to be able to do that? Do you think? who would traditionally have been in our applied class are finding more success now in these heterogeneous classes than they might have before. They're being exposed to a more sophisticated level of mathematical dialogue. They're being exposed to more you know, sophisticated uh, mathematical concepts. Um, so the, the hope is that as we're sort of bringing more kids into the fold, that once they reach us at the high school, they're going to be ready to move into more advanced courses. Right. So I guess that, 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 that formative assessment will be ongoing as, as next year plays out and as, as these students end up in the high school and seeing if they're, if we end up with what it was before was whatever the, the advanced math class sort of taking whatever it was, you know, jump, starting with geometry starting with or whatever. Geometry. If we end up seeing enrollments similar to what we have now, then we'll, that's one, whatever, sort of one benchmark we'll have. Yeah. And, and this, this spring we're going to pilot the eighth grade math test. It won't really serve the same role it ultimately will because we're not 
that far along in the cycle yet. And ultimately, that's going to be the test that determines if students are ready for one semester of Algebra 1 at the high school rather than the two semester mm -hmm. version. And um, we don't expect them all to be yet because we haven't prepared, made the eighth grade be what it needs to be right. yet. Right. But that's what we're headed towards. But that's what we're, we're, and the goal yeah. would be that yeah. in two, three years, what we're seeing is you know just as many students going into geometry as we've got now, but additionally, a bunch of students taking one semester of algebra instead of two semesters of algebra. And that's really the critical piece because by having the, the one semester of algebra rather than the full year of algebra, it means that students can move courses forward and get to AP Calc by their junior year. Whereas currently, the only kids who were able to get to AP Calc by their junior year were those kids who did algebra here at JFK. Right. Or they could take some other course the second semester or the other semester in their freshman year, some non-math course. Oh, exactly. It opens right. up a spot in their schedule. Right. Right. Exactly. And also frees oh. up the schedule for the eighth graders a whole lot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, right. as well. Yeah. Yeah. It gives the teachers more flexibility in the high school, too, if algebra Absolutely. one's becoming one, uh, one block, one semester as opposed to two semesters. That could be, I mean, you guys were estimating maybe five periods, five more periods of math that yeah. math teachers would be free to teach another course. New elective, smaller sections of our AP and honors courses that are overloaded, so. Well, and, and the two semester version of, of algebra, hopefully those sections could be smaller so that those students who needed more attention could get it. Get it. Mm -hmm. We shall see. Right, mm -hmm. and, and the whole process is about collecting data, and that's what we're doing over the next mm -hmm. two or three years to see how this, you know, really is rolling out for our students and focusing on that. Mr. Meyer. Um, I had a question about how differentiated instruction interacts with assessment, because you have students working in different groups, and there are different mastery levels. Mm -hmm. And they may be enjoying the same level of success in terms of problem solving, but at two distinctly different levels. And then you have them come to the summative assessment, which may be a common assessment. Or you also have to place them on a, a grading scale, which also is meant to be universal. And I'm just, you know, obviously this is something that you have to deal with. I'm just wondering strategies and what, how the team is, is trying to get a common philosophy to apply across grades. So Tim actually had three tests that we were looking at today on the same content, and he can talk about that. So we're also differentiating assessment. With the common assessments, I think we're using those, and those will be the same assessment at the end of two units of the, invest, of the uh, connected math to really determine where all the kids are at that point. But within the classroom, Tim's differentiating his, his assessment right now. So he can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, basically, um, they may have the same objectives, like certain um, standards they're trying to meet, and they're just meeting them at different levels. Oftentimes, it's just manipulating the numbers. Um, for example, in working with proportional relationships, we did a mini unit. Um, part of one of these assessments was uh, manipulating recipes, you know, tripling a recipe, or say a recipe serves four people. Um, maybe you want to serve seven people or ten people. We might give that to the higher functioning kids where the kids that are at a lower level, we might just say, you know, how much of each ingredient do we need if we double the recipe? So part of it's just how the numbers are manipulated. Um, you know, I generally have the same objectives written on the board for the kids. It could be fairly general. Um, you know, one could be be able to calculate the sale price of an item. <clears throat> Maybe for some kids, it's a real easy percent to work with. It's 25% off. Maybe for some other kids, it's 35% off. So they're still kind of working on the same skill. They're still finding a sale price. Some are just doing it with more difficult numbers. So that's one example of how we kind of manipulate assessments. Oftentimes, it's just changing numbers around. I would say that that kind of differentiation is the exact same kind of differentiation that we do with assessment at the high school. Now, but just in terms of if you're, you know, success provides motivation and engagement, and so it's a positive. But then you also, if kids are, you know, lack of success can also provide some motivation to work harder, to achieve more, to, you know, try to reach <laughs> that next level. And I guess that there's a tension there in that if you're differentiating the assessment, then someone who's in, let's say, a lower level of mastery might say, well, I'm, I'm good. I got, you know, 90% of this assessment, but you <coughs> recognize as a teacher that they could be moving on to application mastery or extending it even further. So I'm just wondering, how, how, is that, how is that structured in the program so that we make sure that that's happening for our students? There's a lot of observation students. involved in that, kind of feeling out what kids can really do a lot of it. kind of comes through just looking over their shoulders, right. conversations with them. And so maybe at the start of the year, a kid, you know, you're trying to build their confidence, maybe they're not doing as well. So if you give an assessment at three different levels, maybe they're starting at the lowest level, 
Dennis, they, they started to get into success from kind of up the ante for them. And maybe they take the middle level exam instead of the lowest level exam. So we kind of observe that throughout the year, make sure we're not cheating them in any way by kind of giving them any kind of modified work and really try and appropriately challenge them to make sure we're pushing them while not overwhelming them. So a lot of that's done through observation, conversation with the students. And I think also it's important to note that, you know, what a kid may struggle with one unit and have great success in another unit. So perhaps a kid has a real, you know, weakness with fractions, yeah. but when they move on to another unit, the kid is really soaring. So perhaps they took the lowest level assessment in the fractions unit, but then they're taking the highest level assessment in the next unit. So I think there's some sort of balancing out that happens there, too. I, and I just want to say, too, one of the things that's happening is the math department, as well as all the departments in at JFK, we're looking at student work as a practice. Um, so we have student work exemplars, and we're looking at student work <coughs> as a team and as a department. So I think that's a really helpful way also to um, really take a look at what students are doing and how we're challenging them. Thank you. I think it's just a, a amazingly exciting to see a, a vertical team and giving so much thought to instruction and evaluation. Um, and having also, I think, the time away from the classroom to come together is just critical, and I hope we continue to support that as a school committee. And I have one other thing, too. Since we've been meeting monthly, it's great to be able to hear from them, you know, here's what you guys are doing that's working. Here's what maybe you could do to support the kids even more. Here's what you could do to prepare kids for honors classes. And, you know, I'm sure when we're telling them what we're doing, it, it allows them to really plan their instruction. Absolutely. And so yeah. it's, it's been really... It's just been such a great experience. I just uh, wanted to echo, it's so wonderful to see middle school and high school teachers working together for our kids because, you know, they, they, they our levels aren't vacuums. It's not, you know, an elementary vacuum, a middle school vacuum, a high school vacuum. The kids go right through and it's just, it's wonderful to hear this. And I mean, you all sound so thoughtful about how you're approaching it and so collaborative and I just wanted to acknowledge that. But um, I wanted to ask, last year when, when this was all being presented, we had a number of parents come to us who were very concerned. Are you still hearing from those parents, or have their concerns been put to rest for the most part? I think that for the I, I've heard some positive feedback from some of the parents that were concerned, which is really terrific, and it speaks to what they've been doing in the classroom and the work that we've been doing to prepare. Um, there's we continually look at students and figure out what's going to work best for them. And it's really important that the students advocate for themselves and that the parents advocate for the students. So if we do hear from, from parents, it's a, you know, a, a collaborative process trying to solve the problem. So I, you know, typically in a year I will hear from a few parents. It's no more this year than it has been in any year, to be honest with you. I think it may be less. Um, but there are exceptional kids and we need to problem solved together to make sure we're meeting the needs of those students. But to be honest with you, no, um, it's, it's, there's been some positive feedback as the, well as some working together. too that it's going to be well known that the, the kids' needs are being met. This program is working right. the way it's intended to. So yeah. good. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Salt. And I just wanted to close by saying thank you for an, uh, the work you do every day, uh, but also thank you for being here tonight and for answering all of these questions. I think uh, you hit all of the frequently asked questions and did so in a very thoughtful and intelligent way. I also want to thank you and remind uh, people at home who are listening that this was not an idea that you came up with one summer and implemented. This is something you've thought about, worked on, and carefully structured the implementation over a couple of years. And so I really appreciate that thoughtful, long-range vision that you brought to this implementation. Thank you. Thank you. So the next uh, report that we'll be receiving is a um, principal entry plan, uh, structured interviews. This is for from Bridge Street School principal uh, Beth Choquette. Principal. Good evening, and thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'd like to start out first of all by saying uh, what a privilege it is to be able to work at Bridge Street Elementary School. Um, what an amazing group of teachers, students, families, the Ward 3 community, and it's really a privilege to be able to work with all those folks. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to um, share with you tonight um, what I call my structured interviews. Uh, coming in 
last summer um, after I was hired, um, I really wanted to find a way to get to know the school before I actually started the process of working there. So I wanted to do what I called structured interviews with the faculty and staff and as many parents as I could get to come in and participate in this. And um, those structured interviews involved the same four questions that I asked people. I wanted to know what they thought their strengths were of Bridge Street Elementary School, what they thought the challenges were. Um, I always like to ask, I, I call it my dream question, if money wasn't an issue, what would be the one thing you'd like to see at Bridge Street? And then um, how I can best serve and support them as their principal. And so what you see here on your first page, and I apologize, there's two packets that aren't in color when you get to the pictures. Um, but if you look on maybe with someone next to you, maybe they were lucky to get the color. <laughs> but um, so you see the, the top four, when I put together the data, the top four answers that um, both faculty and staff and parents gave me. Um, the challenges of Bridge Street School um, was something I was um, truly concerned about. Um, so I made that as one of my school improvement goals as part of uh, my evaluation process. And the goal you can see on your second page um, at the top, um, the gist of the goal was to take those top four challenges at Bridge Street and figure out a way and take the action steps to turn them into our strengths. And so what I'm gonna do tonight is go through and talk to you about the, some of the action steps we have taken already to start to turn those challenges into our strengths and some of our um, action steps we're planning on implementing as we go into the next school year 2013-14. The first challenge, um, the one uh, that came up the most was a consistent behavior plan. And um, I wanted to begin to implement uh, the Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports Program at Bridge Street, which um, there's a picture in there of you, for you of a red, yellow, and green chart, and our teachers add the orange. Every classroom in our school has that. The cafeteria has it, the playground has it. Every setting of the school has that chart where the, the students are. And um, as you can see on the bottom, the green spot, there's clothespins with students' names. And during the course of uh, the day in the classroom, cafeteria, wherever it may be, um, based on behaviors or what is going on in the classroom, those names can move up the chart. And the idea of it is to get rid of the time that a teacher spends discussing behaviors with students and try to keep them more on task with the learning. And then creating that visual for students to see, oh, my name just moved to the yellow. What do I need to do to fi fix that, to go back to the green, or and hopefully not move to the orange or the red? So we implemented um, that system. I've also, I am on your next page there, um, is the new incident reports, um, which we did not have at Bridge Street, to create um, data to be able to follow patterns of certain students to see if patterns were developing and just to have a record of behaviors in the school. And also to have some accountability um, for these to go home and parents to really see um, some behaviors that students may be exhibiting at the school. So we implemented that. And you also have in there, and I apologize, it might be a little blurry, the posters of what we call our four R's, being respectful, responsible, reliable, and reasonable. And those are posted as well throughout the school. Our next steps for this uh, challenge going into next year is to create a matrix around those four R's. And what I mean by a matrix is having um, those four R's posted in every setting of the school with um, items listed under each of the four R's. What does it mean to be respectful in gymnasium? What does it mean to be responsible in gymnasium? What does it mean to be respectful in the ladies' room, the, the men's room? What does it mean to be respectful on the playground? And having a matrix for every setting of the building for students to really understand what those four R's mean and what they mean in different settings um, of the school building. The second challenge came up um, around not enough staff. And when I say not enough staff, I talk about um, support staff. Um, so being um, 
more of a, a, a money issue when it comes around staff. We had to be creative to think about, well, what are we going to do with the resources that we have um, to really help support our students? So we have implemented more inclusion with our resource staff, working within the classrooms, um, with the teachers, with their students that they work with. Providing more uh, training for teachers in the co-teaching model. We have a couple teachers who are trained at Bridge Street in the co-teaching model. Um, and trying to provide more training for that in, in hopes to be able to implement that in the future. And using um, one of our resource room teachers who will be working with their special ed students who also have behavioral issues and really providing a safe environment for those students where their needs can really be met, um, which we have also implemented. Next steps for next year, we would like to uh, pilot flexible grouping for math and um, also begin to implement um, some co-teaching in the building with the staff that is trained. The third challenge on there was, of course, our level three status. Um, one of the things I wanted to do when I first came to Bridge is to really create a positive environment for both faculty and staff and our students, as well as our parents and our community members that visit our school every day. Um, I implemented weekly celebration to really stress the importance of community in our school and we meet for about 15 minutes at 9 o'clock every Thursday morning and everybody is invited to attend. Um, the classroom teachers, this was new to them and they really stepped up to the plate. I've asked them all to sign up for a week so their students can present something they're working on in class. You know, today we had a third grade class present a beautiful poem that they wrote around Valentine's Day and kindness. Um, so it's a really wonderful thing and it, it was new for them and you know the kids love it We've get we get a ton of parents who come and it's really um, a nice opportunity just to pull us all together as a school community and to kind of remember that we are all in this together and we are a family um, so we implemented that this year I really focus on three big R's rigor relevance and relationships um, a rigorous curriculum and instruction is really important relevance um, is best teaching practices and relationships and I always put relationships first because I feel like if you don't have the relationship and the trust the other two R's aren't going to happen so um, that's been a big focus those three R's with the between myself and the staff this year and trying to change the mindset to really have a focus on uh, the mastery of our new standards. Um, what are we doing to ensure that our students are mastering our new Common Core standards and are college and career ready? Um, we have posted visual objectives and at the elementary level, instead of using the word objectives, I like to call them I can statements. And when you walk into the classroom, you see those I can statements on the board. Um, even at the elementary level, it's important for students to know what they're going to be learning and why they're learning it and why is it important um, in, their, in their world and using more pre and post assessments to really help inform and guide our instruction. And we've also um, started a book study and the book study we're doing this year is um, on Doug Limov's book, Teach Like a Champion, which I would recommend for anybody to read, even if you're not a teacher, it's a wonderful book. And what I really loved about our staff at Bridge Street is after our very first session of doing the first couple of chapters together, when I walked through the classroom, teachers were already implementing some of these strategies, which is really great to see and see them embrace that. Um, our next steps for our third challenge, obviously, is to be out of the level three status, which is the goal. Um, continue the new things that we have implemented this year. Increase our data analysis and really looking at um, the data of student assessments. And just for all of us to remember that change does take time. And I constantly uh, remind my staff of that because, you know, they're under a lot of stress and it does take time and I tell them we will get there. Um, the last challenge on there is not enough time to collaborate. I was told that a lot by teachers that they just don't have time to collaborate. So I um, created a schedule that allowed for common planning time um, at least three times a week um, that teachers are able to have that that time together. I also implemented weekly grade level team meetings where um, each grade level meets with me once a week. And um, provide, I provided a consistent schedule for monthly staff meetings. They know that they are always the second Thursday of the month. And um, also during that time with my staff to provide valuable professional development and professional learning communities. And our next steps for this challenge um, for next year, going into next year, is to continue what we've started <coughs> 
and to create um, a schedule that will also include our resource room teachers to be part of that common planning time, which is very difficult, but um, that's my summer project. So, and that's it. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Ms. Mitt? Not so much. Well, maybe one question, but also a comment. I love the relevance thing. How many, I, I mean, and, and anybody who's been around for very long has heard, probably heard me say this before, but it's like, you know, is this going to be on the test? Why am I learning this? Mm -hmm. It's so, it's so wonderful to have somebody who has the mindset that they're, that they're teaching it because you need to know it and the kids are learning it because it's interesting and they want to know it right. without wondering, is it, am I going to be tested on it later? So thank you for that. That's great. Um, I'm curious about the incident report. Yeah. Um, did did these things come from your parent your your handbook your what do you call yeah, it and that? yeah in part with the handbook and in part with my experience from the um, my previous district we brought these in um, one of the things that te the teachers were really concerned about is that we had no documentation process to really look at patterns of students um, to kind of support them better. Um, so yes, it was looked at in combination with um, the, the handbook. Okay, and then maybe the last question you said, not enough time to collaborate, so you've made uh, common planning time? Common to planning time in the grade level team meetings for okay. teachers. Okay, the common planning time, who who's doing that? Because you also said, so, okay. so we have you said teachers per grade level, so they are meeting together, and the next step for that is to be able to involve our uh, resource room teachers into that process, um, which, it's a scheduling um, difficulty, but we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Meyer. So in terms of the level three, have you gotten feedback from the teachers as far as implementing things that they have gleaned from the data analysis and whether that time spent in the data analysis is, is changing their instruction in a way that they see it? Yes, so absolutely. They feel like there is more of a focus. You know, when we talk about the the data now and the objectives or I can statements, um, they a lot of the feedback that I have gotten from them is they finally feel like there there's a focus and they are looking at students and looking at their work and changing their teaching practices and readjusting where they need to based on that data and looking at the needs of the students. Um, I've gotten very positive feedback on that. Um, our data team right now at Bridge is, um, it's a large data team. We um, really strive to have, have all of the grade levels involved to get the perspective from preschool all the way up to the fifth grade together and share those ideas. The hope for next year is to um, have some sub data groups um, to look at uh, assessment as well and provide training for that. Um, but a lot of positive feedback on that and how it's really helped change their instruction and their focus in the classroom. I'd just like to make a comment. Thank you for being here tonight and for doing this for the school committee. I just want to say that your um, focus on academics, your leadership, your commitment, your creative ideas that you brought to Bridge Street is exactly what Bridge Street needed. And I held my listening session uh, a couple days ago at Bridge Street, and the teachers are absolutely thrilled at the ideas you've brought and your commitment to implementing these new ideas. And I think that uh, Bridge Street is really on the right track, thanks to you and the teachers. Uh, very well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Um, so that completes the two reports. Um, the next item, I will be having a report uh, from uh, uh, Jennifer Towler on our school choice uh, program, and then we are required to take a vote uh, regarding our continued participation <coughs> in the school choice program. Mm -hmm. I'll get it started. It's time for our annual vote on mm -hmm. school choice. And last year we did this. I presented the information to you. But I thought it would be nice uh, on Valentine's Day for Jennifer Towler to come <laughs> and be at the meeting. She does such a great job in her role as registrar, keeping track of the data, interacting with parents, creating a very welcoming feel to the office and to registration. 
She is the kind of person who's on top of every detail in the office and is always forward thinking, bringing me new pieces of data before I even think that I may need them. And so I wanted her to be here tonight to answer your questions, to present some of her work, and also to receive the red recognition she deserves for the hard work she does every day. Um, so there was uh, some information in the packets, which we can uh, kind of go over. Um, but there just had some hist historical information about school choice program. Northampton Public Schools has been accepting non-resident students since 1997. Uh, we started with high school students and then moved on adding elementary after that. Uh, the state school choice limit is $5,000 per student, and the special education costs are paid in full by the sending district. And the revenue that we derive from the school choice is an important factor in funding our schools. Uh, right now, um, the data that we had was from January, and we had uh, 2,733 students district-wide, and of that total, uh, 222, which is approximately 8%, are school choice students. So the um, attached uh, sheets, the first one is the school choice and resident summary that has uh, each school broken down by resident students versus school choice students. Uh, do we have any questions on, on that one at all? And then the next two sheets, um, the first one is the incoming students, and this is a five-year breakout of how many we've had. So um, this is the number of school choice students, which has ranged from 185 to our current number, which is 222. And those numbers have remained fairly steady over the last five years. And then the bottom chart shows the number of Northampton students who are choosing to attend other public schools. And these numbers have ranged from 64, that's an estimate for this year, to a high of 85, and that was in 2009, 2010. And these numbers are pretty typical in terms of having approximately three times as many students incoming as we have outgoing. And then the last sheet. You can pause for just a moment. I think it's important to note once again that last year we put in a new process of communication with families. We expedited the communication so families knew earlier that they were on, they were accepted, or they were on the waiting list. We opened more seats for families, and we increased the number of students that came into our district. Uh, my opinion is that I believe we may have maximized the number of students we can bring in. I believe we still had some seats open. Uh, for families and, and available. So I just wanted to make note of that to the school committee that we, we did that last year. We did bring in more students, which of course brought in more revenue, um, but it's not something we can keep doing and say, well, let's bring in another 100 school choice kids. Uh, they're not there. We've cleared our waiting list. Did you want to agree to that or comment yeah, on it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And we do always have a higher demand in certain grades than we have spaces. And then the grades that we sometimes have more space, we don't have a demand for. So. We typically have more applicants at the kindergarten level, uh, sixth and seventh grade, and then at the high school at the ninth grade. So those incoming grades into the schools. Um, and then the last sheet is just the uh, the sending and receiving districts, and this is an interesting breakdown that shows where our school choice students are coming from. Uh, with East Hampton, Holyoke, Hampshire Regional, and Hatfield, the four uh, districts where we get the most students from. And then the bottom chart shows where our students, our resident students, are attending. Um, and those are uh, Hatfield, Hampshire Regional, East Hampton, and Frontier Regional. And that's interesting because there's a little bit of a kind of a game of Red Rover that goes on with students that move within the communities and wanting to stay at the school that they've been attending. So that's uh, kind of a factor uh, there. And again, those numbers are uh, fairly steady over the last five years. Um, and then I just wanted to make a note that um, the vote that you take annually always seems a little bit confusing. And I just wanted to clarify that um, when the school committee makes that vote, it's on the participation in the school choice program. To withdraw from participation means the school would be a sending district only, and a no vote means that you're both accepting and receiving students. And that's all I've got. Is there any, uh, there any questions? Any questions? Okay. So I, yes. I do have one. Um, I'm curious, I'm just looking at the, the numbers um, in terms of 
who's going to which schools and who's coming from which schools. And I'm wondering if there's any thought about the numbers from East Hampton changing once their new school, their new high school is, when, when kids are coming from East Hampton, are they mostly coming in the early grades or are they, have they been coming for high school or do you have a sense of that? Well, if you look at that breakdown, if you go across, oh, um, it shows sorry. the elementary, middle, and high school students. So that's when they're entering. Mm -hmm. okay. Or is that the students right in, that's that, where they are right as now? As they are right now. Okay, that's our, so the current population of students. But it, it, so my it question was more of, of a sense when we have new kids coming in a, in a given year, are they coming for the high school? And I'm wondering if that's going to change with East Hampton opening up its new high school. It's not an answer that I expect you to have. Right. I'm just wondering if it's something that we need to be aware of. I would, my comment on that being one who works in East Hampton, and I would not speak negative about our district. Um, but I would say in regards to school choice and I, what I've always seen it to be in, in its benefit is that um, if you're not happy with the educational institution within your city or town, the state is allowed for you to send your student to another place. Um, I think that has great benefit because um, it doesn't necessarily mean the bricks and mortar are better in one town or another it's the education and so when we bring in the amount of students we are bringing in from other districts I think it's a testament to what we heard tonight as far as how we're working on curriculum and trying to um, you know uh, bring up our, our, our student achievement and how we're working at doing those things and although we're, we're getting a multi-million dollar high school which I will be very happy to work <laughs> and teach in um, it's what goes on within the building, which I really believe attracts families um, in or out of a district. So um, if we get more students to stay in East Hampton, I hope it's because the education that we're offering to the kids is what brings and keeps them there, and not just that we have a 40 plus million dollar new building to go and house the students in. So. Mr. Meyer. So I just had a question. I mean, looking at the, the outgoing students, Hatfield, public schools and especially the elementary um, are an outlier and I'm wondering one thing we talked about in past years about school choice was to what extent are we trying to determine why parents are leaving are we doing any kind of exit interviewing if you will of, of parents as they make another choice to try to find out what you know what is it that's motivating them is it maybe just that they moved from another town and they want to stay and they want to have their kids stay with that peer group um, or is there something distinctive about the educational opportunities at another school that's motivating it? And I'm just wondering whether we're doing that or whether that's maybe data that's just too difficult to collect at this point. We're not doing it formally. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to do it more systematically. That was one of our ideas last year. We talked about the director of development to right. be able to do some exit interviews and gather that kind of data. However, parents talk to Jennifer. Jennifer has anecdotal data. So if you care to share some of those ideas, you can, but it's up to you. We have talked about collecting the data. It would be interesting. I mean, yeah. we do ask on the school choice forms why people want to come mm -hmm. to our school, but we are not seeing why people are leaving the district. Right. Um, we have had some um, families come back to us that had been school choiced out, and they, you know, told me some of the reasons that they had initially left uh, the district, and it was probably five or six years ago, and a lot of those families have come back to us, so that's mm -hmm. been a positive. Um, yeah, in the Hatfield Public Schools, with the number being so high of the outbound um, and 24 of them being in the elementary, I know of a couple of, of them that are families that have moved, and that would account for a couple of sets of twins, for example, so there's four of the kids. My question to you for Hatfield Public Schools is the elementary school is 24 and the middle is six and the highest. Are they coming back here after they're done with the elementary? And that was one facet of the question. And the other is, do you know how many families that actually represents when in Hatfield? Um, we haven't tracked when they're coming back per se, and as far as how, what those, who those students are, we do have that information. Every year we report out our school choice students and where they're coming from, and the other um, districts do the same thing. So I have like a list that we compile and it gets sent to the state. Um, it's part of our, um, it's like the January census data. So we do have that, something I could look at. I haven't had a chance to look at that, um, but we could if, if it was something Brian was interested in. Well, I'm just, I'm also wondering how many families it's represented. I mean, because I know that 
I know of three, I know of five kids that are of two families that are, would account for 19 of those right there. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, if yeah, I wouldn't want families us to would guess, look, we'd have to look really that look up. it up. Okay. Jennifer, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for presenting this information. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, this is for school committee, this is our annual vote. I'll let you pose a question. So we just, w what we need on the, is a motion on the floor to withdraw from participation in the school choice program for the 2013-2014 school year. So I can move that. Okay. And there's there a second, second on that motion. So again, um, uh, a vote in the affirmative would withdraw us from that program. So I believe the recommendation of the administration would be for the school committee to oppose that motion. So. Um, is there any further discussion on the motion? Um, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. No. All those opposed uh, say nay. Nay. No. Okay. Any abstentions? Okay, great. So uh, the motion one. fails, <laughs> as, we, as we had hoped. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> Uh, okay, the, um, next we have a series of uh, gifts. Uh, the first is a gift of uh, $3,275, and this is from Northampton uh, High School PTO. Uh, do we want to take these together, or do you want to discuss them individually, or? Um, I guess it's up to you. We can vote them all together if you want us to address them individually. We can. This is pretty standard PTO gifts uh, to the schools uh, for grants to teachers and NHS and at the elementaries for to support our technology initiatives. And a reminder that all checks given to the district are given to us for the general fund. They do not necessarily get earmarked for specific schools, so we take these dollars and we support all of our schools equally. So. Um, I, just, I had the question, I just want to pose the question, could we con consider them as a group, I guess? <coughs> well, I have a question on that. I okay. mean, Ryan Road School, are, are they, they would, still, they, pulled they, they did pull it out. Yeah. Okay. So it would just be the three uh, for the high school, Jackson Street, and JFK Middle School. Um, the, so I, I already mentioned the NHS gift. There's a $4,500 gift from the Jackson Street PTO and a $5,760 uh, gift from the JFK Middle School PTO. I move that we accept them all. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Uh, okay. Mrs. Minnick, do you have a question? Um, yes. The superintendent just said this was pretty standard and uh, to to receive gifts like this. Right? And in my recollection, it's not so standard. And this is actually just a wonderfully generous thing on behalf of the PTOs. I wonder if you have some background that you could give us as to how they came up with this because I, I would not want them to think that we're doing this no. as a matter of routine. This is standard acceptance according to policy. Okay. Standard Excellent. generosity. <laughs> <laughs> Exceptional <laughs> generosity. Thank yes. you for pointing that out. Okay. I wouldn't want to be misunderstood. Uh, I would have to say that the, um, our initiative in technology has been exciting for our families uh, and our teachers. They've been waiting for this, and they're really uh, feeling the changes that our new Director of Innovative Instruction and Technology, Angelo Rota, seated in the back, has brought to our district. And the not just the equipment, but the training and the, the care and the teaching that he does and his team is doing with the teachers has been very well received. It's making a big difference in our district. And I have to say that the article in the Gazette didn't hurt us at all. Uh, parents read that, PTOs read that, and they said, we want to be a part of supporting Angelo, supporting the teachers, and helping the schools. And they really stepped up and came forward with these generous donations to help us. Well, I just, uh, my own personal perspective, I, I know that um, I, I can remember when I sat on the PTO thinking that there were a lot of things that were going on that um, the school department or the school system itself, the district should have been paying for and that I felt were already falling to PTOs and that was some 20 years ago and 
it's only worsened over the years, the, the number of things that the district is no longer able to provide and the, the slack that the PTOs are picking up. So for them to commit this level of funding to something says that they really do support it and appreciate it. So I'm, I'm kind of um, awestruck by, by their generosity. And I'd like to say to the PTOs how much we appreciate the, their commitment to this, their support of what's going on and their generosity, knowing that they could be spending it on field trips or something else, but they've chosen to put it all together in a big lump and hand it to us. So I think I, I just thank you to the PTOs. Well, on Lisa's point to go, um, they are handing it to us. However, looking at the memos and having attended Ryan Rhodes PTO meeting last night, we're withdrawing the um, the gift, or at least at this point, at best postponing it, is because of some misunderstanding. And, and, and the superintendent started off saying that we can't earmark it, that it's going for it. And yet the memos at the bottom of the, they say smart board projectors, document purchase of 12 projectors for JFK. And the PTO is in an interesting position as far as, I think, as far as the giving of the gifts, because the PTOs basically represent their own schools. So I'm not sure that there's a complete understanding, just by the fact that there's memo lines stating what it's for, that there's a complete understanding of the process or um, the fact that it goes to the district and the technology fund. And I know from last night going in and talking to Mark today and getting some clarification that I'm pretty sure, and I'm not actually positive because it was kind of iffy last night, but that it's not really understood, the process isn't really understood. And then to further that one step, the fact that all of the other three checks that we're accepting have on it a purpose in the memo line tells me that it's not understood. So I just wanted to address that and, and also address the idea that the acceptance of gifts should be, I think it should be looked at. Um, with this in mind, that because a PTO, I think, falls into a different category um, than a business or a community funded. They're people that work really hard to get their schools and to further their schools. And I was hoping that somebody from Ryan Road would come and, and, and at least present the issues as far as that they had. And I'm just wondering if the other schools, because when I went, they were prepared to accept it. And, and give the gift and they gave it and they all voted on it previously and it was wonderful. And then they, they received information, which some of it I'm not sure is exactly accurate, but they did receive information and then they voted to, well they wanted to vote to rescind it, they didn't have a quorum. So at that point they're just postponing it, but I think that we need to help people understand at the levels that they can't put anything in the memo line um, because it really doesn't matter if, if that's the case. and. Um, it is very, very generous, and they could be spending it on other things. And what's to prevent them, and I guess the issue last night was what's to prevent them from taking part of our technology budget, applying it, whatever goes to their school, and then the PTO further supplementing the technology budget. And, um, and I think they had some valid points, some very valid points. And so I think that the way that the gifts are given to the PTO, or from the PTO, might be classified differently so that they could go back to their school, but so that they still ended up taking, and we, they all need something. They all need something techno technologically wise, as long as nobody went above, I don't know, it's hard. I think Mark should explain it, because Mark explained it really well to me today, <laughs> as far as if, if you give it to one school and they get it, even if they get it first, the next year it could be given to another school. And that eventually everything's just going to keep going because we don't have it all to give at once. Is that sort of what it was? I'll, I'll take that if that's all right. Thank you. Uh, you have a lot of questions in what you just yeah. said. And what I know. I a couple of them. Uh, <laughs> first, what people write in the memo line is their recommendation. That's what they would like to see happen. And if we can fund uh, the school in that area, that's what we would intend to do is to honor their wishes. Um, there is a difference between the elementary school and the high school. The high school is actually giving the money to those specific teachers who uh, they're giving grants to. And the elementary is, uh, for technology, and that's their recommendation of how we would spend it. According to school committee policy, and as we discussed very recently here, when people give us money, they give it to us for us to use as um, 
in our general fund. So this money goes into a technology account and we try to fund all of the schools equally. I think that's a very good system. We don't want to be in the business of letting a wealthier neighborhood support their school far and above another school so that the technology is uneven. Now I know that that already exists in some schools because of some past experiences, uh, but we are trying to be more equitable uh, for all of our students and to try to spend our money equally. So when we get donations uh, from a PTO for their school, we're able to use our technology money to balance off at other schools that maybe didn't get a donation so we can move their allocation around. But in the end, all schools are better because of these donations. And if there are specific questions from PTOs rather than trying to address it here, Mark or me would be happy to come to PTO meeting and address specific questions that way. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, you said that the one from Northampton High School is to pay for the grants, and the grants that I add up and is what twenty five hundred, maybe thousand, two thousand, yeah, something like that. I'm not real good; they're not lined up really well. But it's not three thousand two hundred seventy five dollars, and so I'm wondering the discrepancy of, of the little note above it and that, and the and the price, or the amount. Right. They want. Um, they have. They accept grants from the teachers. The teachers are accepted, and so they want the money to go to these five teachers for those projects that the PTO is accepting. Um, I can't speak to the additional funds right offhand. Uh, Mark, can you, or can we get back to you on that? Uh, we'll get back to you, and it the narrative in the email does add up to three thousand. The check is for more than what was on here. I think maybe somewhere in the narrative either that something was missed or something wasn't added but the, the check is more for is more in money than what is in the email okay so there are there any other uh, discussion or questions about the accepting these three gifts there's been a motion made and seconded all those in favor say aye aye uh, opposed any abstentions okay so uh Thank you to the PTOs for those generous gifts. Next, we'll move on to a couple of uh, uh, recommended votes put forth by the Rules and Policy Committee, uh, one on technology acceptable use policy, and then health policy for physical examination of students. And I'll turn it over to Mrs. Minnick. All right. Um, these two policies came to you in January. <coughs> It seems like it was eons ago, but maybe it was just a month ago, um, for their first reading. And they are coming back to you tonight for a vote. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to move uh, approval of the policies and then immediately give you a suggestion for amendments of these policies. So I didn't disregard comments from people last month, but the policies that you that you received in your packet, I believe, are the exact same as what you received in January. So. Uh, with that said, I um, move approval and the, the Rules and Policy Committee recommends approval of the acceptable use policy. Second. Okay. Was that a second, Ms. Yes. Ms. Pick? Okay, so there's been a motion uh, made and seconded on the technology acceptable use policy, and then do you have uh, yes. um, an amendment? Yes, after, um, after the committee received this policy and had a chance to look at it, I received a request from Andrew, which was forwarded to Angelo, who agreed that it made perfect sense. And so we are, I move that the, where is it? I move that the policy be revised as follows. If you go to the second paragraph, the stuff that's in italics, it says, in order to provide a proper message to the community, staff posted content on the internet includes but is not limited to. Is that where it's going to be, Andrew? Right there? Yes. Okay. Um, the motion then is to, is to amend it by saying, staff posted content on publicly accessible websites, not just the internet. So, and maybe I could get you or Angela to speak to your, uh, well, so that's my motion to amend. Is there a second? I second that. Okay. okay. And now discussion. So the, 
the, the gist of it is that when you talk about the internet, you're talking about anything that travels on any type of a network between anything. So if someone were to email a picture of a student from Angelo's computer to Brian's computer, it would be a violation of this policy. And I don't think that's the spirit of the policy, so I wanted to restrict it to publicly accessible websites to give ourselves some room to operate. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Angelo is here, he can speak for himself, but it's my understanding that he thought that was a perfectly acceptable revision to the policy. He's nodding yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the, uh, there's a motion to amend, uh, so the vote would be on that amendment. So all those in favor of accepting the amendment to the uh, proposed policy say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now the question is on the amended uh, uh, acceptable use policy. Any discussion or questions about that? Hearing none, all those in favor of adopting the policy say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So the policy is adopted. And I'll have you continue. And so the other policy that you had um, given to you last month was the physical examinations of students. And the rules and policy committee recommends, and I move that this policy be accepted as presented. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. Okay. Good. Um, I'd like to make an, a, motion to, a motion to amend it. The... Um, at our last meeting, I believe it was Howard who had a concern about um, school physician examining school employees. And after hearing your concern, Karen, who's also here, has recommended that the last sentence of the policy now read, the school physician will examine school employees upon referral by the school nurse when, in his or her opinion, the protection of the student's health may require it. Did that capture what you were capture what I was. Right? Yeah. Is that a right there? So that my, so my motion is to amend the policy by adding the words upon referral by the And second nurse. the motion to amend. Okay. So the motion's been made and seconded. Uh, Mr. Moore? We, we also have a, a it's, it would be a um, technical correction. The apostrophe should go after the S. Correct. Yes, I think that I agree with you. I started to say that just now. Um, yes, that, that it captures exactly what I was thinking. It was like, what what would prompt the school physician to go around examining people? So I think that's an excellent amendment. Okay, so um, any other questions or discussion on the amendment? Um, and, and I assume that you were perfectly okay with that amendment. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so we have another nod from the audience. Good. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, um, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the amendment is accepted, so we're back to the question of the amended policy. Any discussion on the, on the uh, physical examination of students policy? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So the policy is accepted. Ms. Minnick. And to, uh, while it's not a vote this evening, um, I just wanted to go ahead and finish up the rules and policy subcommittee. It did meet in January following our last full school committee meeting, and we did discuss at length the rules of procedure for this body. Um, the, uh, the result of that meeting was that it was recommended, it, that there were some changes recommended, and that the, and a vote was taken to recommend the rules of procedure as revised to this body for discussion and approval tonight. However, upon further examination, it would appear that, and basically that was, we said, okay, now these are the big things, now go back and make it match the charter. And when we got started doing that, it just looked like a bloodbath, to be perfectly honest, because I did it in red. Uh, maybe I should have used blue or green, but anyway, it looked really bad. Um, I think we just decided we needed to look at it one more time before we bring it to you in a completely revised form. So for that reason, you are not seeing it here this evening, and I'm asking for your indulgence that it be sent back to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee meeting for one more go-round, and it will come back to you, I hope, at the March meeting, if we can schedule a Rules and Policy meeting before then. Yeah. 
I mean, I think it, it didn't come before us tonight because it's not on the agenda. So I think the it would just be assumed that it would be still waiting further deliberation yeah, in the committee. I was very concerned that there was a vote taken in the Rules and Policy Subcommittee to bring it to this full committee, and it did not get on the agenda. And and I and I, and I um. When, there's a duly, when there was a vote taken by a duly appointed committee, <laughs> you know, a standing subcommittee at a public meeting to send it here, not to put it on the agenda was concerning to me. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm okay with it's going back, but okay. I wanted this committee to know why it wasn't here because the rules themselves actually say that anything referred to a subcommittee comes back to the full com school committee at the next meeting. So. We were like, so you're not allowed to deliberate over multiple meetings on a. I on think a, that we would have to say that we would, you know, ask for, you know, time to consider it further. But I'll move to refer the matter back. I'll to second it. <laughs> okay. Re -re 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, all those in favor of referring uh, the rules uh, back to the Rules and Policy Committee. Say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, great. So uh, we'll do that. The any other items from the rules and policy subcommittee? I hope not. <laughs> I don't. I forgot them if they were. So we'll now move on to the um, superintendent's report. All right. Thank you. Bring you up to date on a few things, and then I'll get to the highlights of our schools. I uh, just want to let you know that uh, since our last meeting, we are putting our finishing touches on the district improvement plan. We'll be doing this over the next few weeks, um, and we'll, we will be able to have it ready for you to vote on in the April meeting is my goal. I want to remind you that our administrators and teacher leaders have completed their training on the educator evaluation tool uh, we, uh, with our MTA trainers. We received training on all six modules, including observations and evidence gathering. And then the training continues on during the faculty meetings, during uh, the building meetings with departments, and also during our next professional development late start on March 13th. Uh, to remind all of you that 50% of our teachers are currently under the new observation and supervision uh, system, and it seems to be going very well. Our ad hoc late start committee, high school late start committee uh, is underway. They've had a few meetings now and requested information from us in the central office. I believe they're getting what they need in a, in a, a fast and productive way and seeing some nods, that's good. Uh, their plan, of course, is to have some proposals or report back to us uh, by April 1st. Would you just quickly announce who those members are? I, I think it was in the newspaper, but uh, no, <laughs> but maybe one of our school committee oh. members could. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take a stab at it? <laughs> um, Sorry. I don't I'll, get, I'll take a stab at it and you tell me who I've forgotten. Um, there's uh, f high, two high school students, Ezekiel Baskin and um, Johanna Renard. There's two high school teachers, um, Janet Hicks and Randy Gordon. There are um, several community members, uh, one, one, one a former uh, school committee member, um, Lucy, Lucy Hartree, Hartree and who's the, chair now. who's the chair of our committee, and a former school nurse, and who's Best, Best Detmold, who actually is also a former school committee member. Also a former, yeah. yeah, Best Detmold, and um, a parent of a high school kid. Um, Harvey Hill. Harvey Hill and, um, and a, a, a local entrepreneur, uh, Steve Harrell. And I believe that's everybody. And the, the school committee reps? Two of you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Thank sorry. you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I sent you a note, uh, I believe yesterday, the building safety committee met uh, following the recommendations from the principals who worked with their faculties on looking at recommendations to improve safety in our schools. They submitted their lists. We met with uh, members of the police department to review those lists and to begin to set priorities, things that we can do to feel safe and also to be safe, and then things that we can do within our budget and things that will require uh, budget requests for the future. I just want to remind 
you and remind the public that our safety plans and security measures are not public information, but I wanted everybody to know that that's something that we're working on and we can continue to develop and improve our practices. I've been doing my listening sessions in the schools with the teachers over the lunch periods. It's something I enjoy very much and it seems the teachers enjoy it as well. I get uh, pages of notes from them and have wonderful conversations. I've completed three schools so far, Jackson Street, the high school and bridge. Uh, I've had to reschedule thanks to snow days. Uh, two of the other schools, but I should have those all finished in the next two or three weeks. I wanted just a reminder to all of you and to parents at home that kindergarten registration will begin very soon. Uh, this information is posted on our district website or you can call the district office and we can give you uh, the date and time for your school. Uh, in case you don't remember, I have a chance to write it down right now. Bridge Street registration is on Tuesday, February 26th from 2 p.m. to 6.30. Leeds Elementary is Wednesday, February 27th from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Jackson Street School is Tuesday, March 5th, again from 2 to 6.30 p.m. And R.K. Finn Ryan Road Elementary School kindergarten registration is on Thursday, March 7th from 2 to 6.30 p.m. Remember, your children are welcome. They have uh, people there to help uh, supervise the students and coloring stations set up. So uh, bring your family along with you when you come to register. The highlights. Uh, this month I focused on nonfiction writing, one of the elements of a successful curriculum, uh, K-12, uh, is nonfiction writing. And I wanted to give you an example of what's going on in our schools around this. Um, you have some in front of you from Leeds. The third graders were working on persuasive writing and they were trying to persuade me to have more snow days. They are convinced it worked <laughs> because they gave this to me two weeks ago. <laughs> so they are feeling great about their nonfiction writing. Persuasive. <laughs> At Bridge Street School, the kindergarten is writing about and studying Japan. They're reading the Magic Treehouse book and the Night of the Ninja. They're writing about Japan and the people, the geography, the customs, origami, calligraphy, food, and tea ceremonies. The third graders at Bridge Street just completed a nonfiction unit on writing inform informational all about books. They explore the features of a text and learn how each feature helps a reader better understand a nonfiction text, and then the students applied the knowledge when they wrote their own informational books. Out at Ryan Road, the teachers throughout the grades are implementing nonfiction writing expectations of the new Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. First graders in Mrs. Ramsden's and Miss Egito's class have been writing persuasive letters, including one to the principal asking for a classroom pet. The second graders in Mrs. Dillman and Mrs. Brady's classes have just completed all about books and a, about a topic of their own choice. The topics range from bees to skateboarding. The fourth graders in Ms. Desmond's and Mrs. Simmons' classes have written nonfiction articles about the natural world and have detailed reflections on their nature field trips. At Jackson Street, the first graders wrote essays to Principal Gwen Agna for their persuasive writing unit. Each essay identified a school issue that the writers felt should be fixed, including not using the school compost, not touching the artwork on the walls, no running in the cafeteria, and why students shouldn't cut in line. The essays also suggested solutions for each of the problems, and Ms. Agna answered each essay and dutifully addressed those problems, the students pointed out. At JFK, the grade six students have been working on nonfiction writing pieces, including uh, first one, students would choose a memory or experience to create a memoir. One student wrote Night Flying, detailing her first time on a Ferris wheel and the good luck of being on the ride during a fireworks show. The second piece was developing how-to instructions to teach a skill or a task. Two students worked together, and one of the products was uh, an essay, Cooking is the Essence of Life, which also included instructions on how to cook a fried egg. The grade seven students have been writing about the short story, Ricky Tiki Tavi. The students analyzed the character, the main character, as both a hero and a villain, and then used text evidence to support their views. And the grade eight students just completed writing pieces analyzing a literary essay for how the author develops tone and conveys emotion through the use of literary devices. 
Over at the high school, the AP Modern U.S. History class wrote three letters to the editor, conservative, liberal, and socialist, from a 19th century political perspective in response to contemporary American issues. As part of their final exam, students in the mostly ninth grade foundations of art uh, had to choose a work of art and write an interpretation, description, analysis, and evaluation of the piece, and then they also did a visual interpretation. And now a few comments on our budget development. Uh, as um, I mentioned at our last meeting when I uh, presented the di draft of the district improvement plan and then shared with you some of our budget concerns and the direction we are going in building our draft budget, which will be presented to budget and property on February 27th in the subcommittee and then to the full school committee in a special budget meeting on February 28th. Uh, our allocation uh, from the mayor is that we will have level funding, uh, plus we have an increase to our chapter, chapter 70 aid of around approximately $69,000. So what this means to us as we build our budget, uh, we take a look at some of our needs, the collective bargaining agreement that we have in place, and also the teacher lane changes. If we look at just those two numbers, ballpark figure would be about $690,000. Um, if we look at what our legal expenses will be through the collective bargaining process and the increase in the new bus contract, estimated at $160,000. Uh, we have something unique on here that is uh, critical for us and, and worthy of explanation, and that is our technology team and department, they don't have a vehicle for their, to transport the computers and the technology and the switches and things that they move from building to building. And so they actually load the things in their own cars, which is not good for the equipment. They put them very carefully in the back seat or in the trunk. Uh, but this is not a good way for us to be moving our technology equipment. Plus, we're asking people to use their personal vehicles to move our school equipment. And so they've requested that we find some way to rent or lease a, a used van, something that we can use to move our technology equipment from building to building for proper installation and care. And that's something that we're we're adding to the budget, it's cost about $20,000 as an estimate, not purchasing a new van or anything like that, but just trying to find some appropriate transportation between the buildings for our technology team. Also, we are factoring in the circuit breaker reduction, given the nine seat cuts that we had this year, we are estimating that we're not gonna get that money back uh, for next year's budget, so it's important for us to factor that in to our number. If I look at just those highlights of things that uh, we need to put into our budget, looking about $905,000 or so that we need to add or account for in building our budget. If I subtract a few things like the Chapter 70, the $69,000, if I factor in some very conservative figures from some ideas that I expressed to you, um, that being if we were to institute a fee for kindergarten students, if that fee were to be as much as $3,000, divided by 10 months, be $300 a month uh, for families to have the full day kindergarten. And if we consider the sliding fee scale and so forth, so it's not just the number of students times 3,000, it would be uh, much less than that. The conservative figure Mark and I come up with is about $288,000 that we could generate from kindergarten fees. If we went with the idea of reducing busing at the high school, that we would only bus kids K through eight, we took the routes away at the high school, um, we would save roughly $47,000. If we were to do a slight increase in our lunch fees and in our athletic fees, and these are not, well, it's significant for a family who has to pay it, but it's not significant for us. We think we could get about $15,000 each, so a total of $30,000 from food service and athletic fee increases. What I calculate from just those highlights, we could come up with uh, savings or an increased revenue generation of about $434,000. So given the increases we need in our budget of 905, and those few things that I mentioned so far, 434,000, those are uncomfortable, unsavory things for us to do. We all know that. Even at that, I would still need to find a way to cut $471,000 from our budget or roughly nine to 10 full-time equivalent employees, uh, teachers that would have to come from our schools. 
this is the very difficult budget that we're working on. It's not uh, pleasant for me to share that with you or to uh, share with the public, but I think it's important that I don't surprise any of you with the draft budget that we bring forward in two weeks. And I'll pause for thoughts and comments unless you want me to just leave it at that for the superintendent's report. Mr. Meyer. Um, is there a question whether charging tuition for a portion of the kindergarten day, does that have any effect on the quality, kindergarten quality grants? Because you have to. No. no. Is it going to be a half day? No. Not to do it right now? No. We're not sure how it plays into the school choice money. Uh, we believe we need to, uh, we're checking on all the details, of course, before we present this to make sure that, well, you know, we got it all over our eyes and crossed our T's. Um, but with school choice, you'd have to let the parents know up front before they apply for school choice that there would be a fee attached to full day kindergarten so that we want to accept, accept them to school choice, get the school choice money, and say that there's a fee. So it would have to be well communicated and transparent. I have a question on the $47,000 eliminating the bus to the high school and it possibly being a need. And um, we had discussed previously, Howard brought up, um, with the school start time was going on a two-tier system with the high school students being on a bus with elementary or something along those lines. I'm not going to get into the details because it doesn't really matter. The idea that I'm thinking of is would it be something that we could look at again and you know, still keep, I mean, still reduce something but be able to provide um, transportation still to the high school students. I mean, it's not ideal to have, you know, elementary and high schools together, but yeah. it's definitely not ideal not to get our kids to school if they're having problems to get to school, even though it's not mandated, I understand, but just seeing if we could work out some sort of collaboration. Remember that this year we did refine our bus service practice. Uh, we maximized the capacity of our buses. We extended the routes as much as we're comfortable extending the routes. We don't want kids on buses for an hour and 20 minutes, you know, and combining routes just makes things take longer. Um, I feel like it's about as efficient as it could be. Um, I do understand that the two-tier system has some attractive qualities to it. I don't know that financial savings more than this uh, would be there. Um, the times that we've looked at it and asked Joy Winnie to look at it, it's different, but not necessarily better as far as the financial picture goes. But we will be um, looking at everything because with a, a budget gap this large, uh, we will be examining everything to find out what we can do. Because again, my goal is to try to reduce things that don't touch the classroom. We want to preserve that relationship with the teachers and the students in the classroom as much as possible. And I don't want to be jumping to increasing class sizes or merging classes at the elementary. Those are things that will have to be a very, very last resort. I want to try everything else first. And trying everything else first is what I was bringing up as far as the, um, I mean, if we have to eliminate, I suppose we have to eliminate, but if there's some way that we can work it together to have the, you know, where it wouldn't cost so much, I don't know, I have no idea. But so we would still be providing transportation to the high school students. Because I think that the kids that take oh. the bus, a lot of them probably need to take the bus to get there. Mm. There is no way that we can provide the same level of service we're providing this year and cut $900,000. We have to know that, we have to accept that. So we can't say, gee, we don't want to do that, let's find another way to still offer that service. We can't do that and have a responsible budget. So that, that's, that's it, I mean, it's, it's eliminate the high school, there's no attempt to try to work out oh, some no, way. as I just said, we will be looking at everything but I want you to understand this happens all the time. This happened last year too. And we said, well, unfortunately we had to cut the literacy coaches. Well, no, we have to find a way to save them. Well, no, you can't save the things that are very important to us and still reduce your budget. We can't do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions for the superintendent regarding this report? Okay, uh, the next item is the business manager's report. Thank you. Um, some of the things in the business manager's report I'll, I'll skip over because the superintendent had covered some of them in regards to budget, but I'll just start off with some of the noteworthy items um, just as, just as a, uh, an update. 
for the public and for everybody else. Is the mayor presented his vision at the joint budget meeting with the city council and the school committee on January 31st uh, in regards to the uh, overall financial condition and status of the city. Um, the budget process, uh, as you know, uh, we're under compressed time frames this, this time around for this year. And again, those are as a result of the, the charter that's in place. Uh, attached to the uh, report is uh, a financial statement that you see each month in regards to the various line items that we have within the budget. Uh, for the most part in the budget, we're progressing pretty much on schedule. There's some, some line items that are over and some that are under, but uh, I'm still moving forward with ongoing meetings with the special ed department and uh, reviewing with them their expenses, trying to track those because we know that those expenses are over and you can see those on the financial report. The student information system. Um, as you know, uh, the Starbase system is no longer going to be supported. We have looked at potential vendors. Uh, we've now narrowed it down to two finalists. Um, we're contacting other school districts to make sure, you know, the references and their recommendations are uh, strong for the, the final two vendors. And hopefully we will finalize by the end of this month as to who our final vendor is and make a selection and that hopefully will be reported out to you at the March meeting. Um, I do want to make note of the maintenance uh, line item that I put on here. I'd like to thank the maintenance and custodial staff for their quick responses to several water pipe breaks, other, you know, and other heating problems over the heating, uh, the, the two-week uh, deep freeze we had a few weeks back. It doesn't seem like we had a deep freeze today. It was wonderful outside, but prior to this, uh, we've had a few problems with the uh, severe cold weather. Um, one of the other noteworthy items is the food service uh, line item. You know, we're still providing quality meals. We've met or surpassed all the USDA requirements. Uh, we've applied for the six cents meal allowance based upon our number of meals served. Um, the district costs for many of the food products continue to rise uh, as well to, uh, as other school districts having the same problem as a result of weather conditions and uh, other financial uh, situations. Um, the food director is uh, reviewing our meal plan and has trimmed back on some of the volumes of the different foods that we have to try to eliminate any waste that might be there uh, as a result of uh, some of the new USDA requirements. So we're still looking into that and there'll be more information forthcoming in the uh, budget and property meetings uh, that are, uh, that'll be coming up. Capital plan items, uh, we're still doing some specifics of the approved capital items, and I'll be specific for the FY13 capital items. Um, so we're still working on the details with uh, central services and the technology department. Uh, the budget process, um, based upon what the superintendent had just presented, uh, where we are with our status, um, and we're going to need more meetings to discuss and do further research on uh, various areas that we can refine, look at cost savings, places that we know that there are going to be increases and other opportunities that we might be able to reduce certain parts of the budget. Are there any questions regarding the business manager's report? Okay, hearing none, uh, the uh, personnel report uh, you've presented as part of the packet. Uh, again, uh, a one-page personnel report. You have the, the new hire during the month of January, uh, the separations and retirements that uh, had taken place during that month. Okay. Is that, can I ask, is, it, is that a typo? Uh, the alt teacher, is that alt, alp or alt? Michael Weaver, second one down. New hires. Oh, yeah, there should be a P there. It was a typo. Okay. Yeah. So I, was just, I didn't know what an alternative was, opening so program. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to find out. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very thank much you. for those, those reports. Um, so that uh, moves us into new business. Um, I actually have one new business item, and that's actually I wanted to uh, amend uh, a couple of the committee assignments that I made earlier in the evening. Um, 
and that was uh, um, for the Budget and Property Committee. Uh, actually, the, the three names would be uh, Mr. Zahowski, Mr. Bourne, and Mr. Moore. And then on Rules and Policy Committee, uh, uh, Ms. Minnick, Ms. Duvall, and uh, Ms. Pick would be the three members of Rules and Policy. So that's a, uh, a mid-meeting change, if you will, uh, that I wanted to announce under new business. Uh, any other new business items? No. Sure, if this is or not, because the agenda sh does not have this meeting, which I believe is scheduled, I want to check, but there's the um, Tuesday, March 5th, there's the budget and property uh, meeting with the school so councils council. at JFK. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. um, yep. And so I don't know if that's new business or simply a technical. Yeah, we should have had that on there. So we'll just. Yeah. There's actually three missing meetings on there, so I apologize for that. Is it because we had 27 special property? Which is, is pending still, actually. There's some people who are, think they might not be able to make that, so you'll hear from me early next week about that. And then on the 28th, there's the school committee meeting. So, which is a budget school committee meeting, the second meeting in February. So I should have that on there as well. So. And we'll make sure we get those posted as well. Yeah. Okay. And then, Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. And then for an additional new business, um, the spelling. Yeah. Those we're gonna yeah. Yes, I know that you had asked about um, discussing that further in new business. So it's, it's, uh, I think we just need a straw poll if people are willing to um, chip in. Chip in their 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 tenth. Of the fee, Although and will well, we have three spill mm. spellers they on the team? Well, we, so I, I would certainly um, vote in favor of, of uh, participating. It's a wonderful, wonderful event. Yeah, I'm willing and to great fundraiser. contribute, yeah. not spell, but I can contribute. <laughs> <laughs> Do we think among us we have three people who are willing to 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 and to spell? Holden, Mike, and Alden. <laughs> yes. Alden usually has its own business. <laughs> yeah, the Alden, yeah, Alden does his own. Student uh, rep. <laughs> right. Not here tonight. Student rep. Yes. Done. Um, I've done it two years in a row. It's a whole lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Um, so if anybody wants to take my place, that's fine, but I'd be happy to do it again. I'll do it if no one wants to do it. Okay, then. Okay. So is that agreement that we want to do? So three people. <laughs> um, so who is that? Do you, you do I, I'm willing to um, collect that. So if you all want to write out checks, you can write write it out right to NEF and give it to me, and then I will I'll pass them all in together. Okay. And if you could get those to me, if anybody has a check, let's do it tonight. But um, let's see. Um, by the next meeting, we're meeting in two weeks, right? Yes. So if you could bring your checks um, in two weeks and give them to me, then I will put them all together and. Um, pass them in. Okay. That's okay. Excellent. Are there any other new business items? Um, we've already discussed the future meetings, and so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.